is, Drew, is that an ice cream? Is that an ice cream truck? I think I think so. Yeah, that's an ice ice cream truck in the uh, truck ice cream truck coming through our neighborhood in the winter, mind you. It's winter here in New Zealand. What in the actual heck? <laughs> Do you want to go get All some? Right. Do you want to go get some? Carry ice on, go do away. I, do you want to go get some ice cream? Oh yeah, hold on, I'll be right back. Okay, cool. Welcome back to Perspective. Uh, this is part two of a response to sean cole's uh the fatal flaws of provisionism so we're responding to him and today we're going to get into his response to mostly our views on election and choosing and uh and i uh, he he does it he he gives it a solid effort in terms of re representing us but I, I we think he misses a few key things he gets real close but uh so we're just going to look uh at our first clip here and we'll just crack into it and start talking about it here it goes the provisionists confuse or conflate election with salvation or election with conversion. They seem to, to confuse those two. And we in the Reformed tradition make a distinction between election and salvation. Often in the confessions, it talks about being elect unto salvation. The conditions for salvation are repentance and faith. Nobody is saved without repenting and believing. Okay. That's conversion repenting and believing. That's not the same thing as election. Okay? Election is God's activity. God is the one that chooses. God is the one who elects and chooses. Great. So he says, uh, God is the one who elects and chooses. Do we disagree with this, Eric? No, we do not, Drew. No. <laughs> Do we believe that we can choose ourselves? No. Shocking. No, we don't. So we don't. It's, it's interesting. You know, I don't want to beat this to death too much. But by saying God is the one who elects and chooses, he's like straw manning our view by saying something that we agree with as though we don't. Because we agree that God elects and chooses. We just don't believe that he does it unconditionally, individually, and prior to creation. So it, it doesn't it doesn't get into the point of contention. And then he starts talking about, well, this is a conflation of categories. When you talk about election and salvation, like those are conflation of categories. But the difference is that provisionists don't believe that you can be saved, don't believe that you can be elect and not saved. If you're saved, then you're elect and you're not saved until you have faith. Because salvation is by faith through grace, uh, by by grace through faith. You know what I'm saying? Like so. So when he says it's a conflation of categories, he's assuming that election and salvation happen separately. But I don't think that, I don't think that they do. What do you think? I think that the nation of Israel was elect, and not all of them are saved. Right. So it it entirely depends on what you mean by election as well. Yeah. Like there's God choosing the people of Israel for a particular service to make his name known among the nations, to be a light to the Gentiles. Uh, and then there's the sense in which we are elect in Christ, which is what Ephesians 1 is talking about. Um, and so in if we're talking Ephesians 1, we're saying, you're right, we reject your categories. You've told us that we're conflating, but, we, but if you say we're conflating, you're presupposing Calvinism. So you need to show us how election is just completely and totally separate in this Ephesians passage from salvation, and I don't see it. Yeah, you'd have to show us that any in, that any time the Bible uses election language, that what they're talking about is individual salvation, individual irresistible sal uh, salvation, that right. that that is individual. Unconditional, unconditional elect, election unto salvation from creation from eternity past salvation. Yeah, from yeah, eternity past yeah. that any time the Bible uses election type language that that's what it's talking about. I have I don't I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. And yeah. okay, I could be wrong about that. Maybe I'm super wrong about that. But you have to show me where you can't just assume that the word election means that because we don't think it, we don't see that anywhere. Where where is that spelled out? Where in right. the Bible does it? equate those two things right you can't just and, equate them 
and then everyone's supposed to nod along with you. You, you have to show us where it means yeah. that. And he would likely point to the phrase, and we'll probably get into this, but he would likely point to the phrase, chose us in him, mm. which he which he might, you know, miss the significance of the in him, but before creation. So he would say, well, Eric, you know, this is where it's at in the Bible. It's right here in Ephesians 1. But, but we would take the emphasis and say, it says in him, mm-hmm. So let's talk about this in him and how this happens. But even worse than that, um, the chosen isn't to salvation. Right. 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 It's chose us in him for before what? the creation of the Lord to be holy and blameless before him. To one day be conformed to the image right. of Christ. To get right. a spiritual blessing one day. Those who are in him will one day get a spiritual blessing. Those who are in him are elected to these spiritual blessings. It's nothing they did. They didn't earn any of that stuff. They didn't right. They didn't do anything to get it. It's just God's sovereign choice. We can use that language too. It is God's sovereign choice to elect them to certain blessings, to adoption, to sonship, to all the blessings in the heavenly places that uh, Paul's talking about in Ephesians 1. It's his sovereign elect choice to uh, make those, to, to give those who are in Christ those kinds of blessings. Yeah, that that's, seems very clear to me that that's what that means. And the and the issue is who is the us? The us is the right. faithful in Christ Jesus again. I think that's a key point that is missed. But we'll we'll get into uh, verse thirteen and fourteen, which he t- this is where I felt like he got so close, but he didn't quite get it. But we're going to look at a, a different uh, segment here that's uh, not about that, but about repenting and believing. That's conversion, repenting and believing. That's not the same thing as election. Okay? Election is God's activity. God is the one that chooses. God is the one who elects and chooses. So there's a confusion of categories here. So he says that uh, election is God's activity. God is the one that chooses. I completely agree. I I completely agree. That's not our point of contention. The point of contention is we reject your claim that your theological categories meaningly differentiate between man's activity and God's activity. We reject your categories. We don't think your categories do the job of making, we think your categories actually conflate that difference. So there is man's part where we have to convert, we have to believe, we have to repent, we have to come to the pigsty of our life and all that, right? Yeah. We have to do all those things. And then God graciously, because he doesn't have to, this doesn't make God do anything. God's not like, well, God will save that guy again. Like it, it, it doesn't pull his strings. It doesn't make him do anything. He's not beholden to us in any way. He's beholden to his own promises. And so he right. promised to save those who did that. So he takes, because he's gracious and because he's lovingly kind and because he never goes back on his promises, he takes those people and he makes them sons of God. He pulls them into blessing. He, he makes them a part of his family. He elects them for these things. Mm. And so you, we don't think you are actually upholding which one is God's activity and which one is man's activity. We just reject those categories you're using completely. Yeah. And I think that, I think that behind this, there's also some discussion surrounding, uh, you know, kind of what you said about uh, he's not obligated or whatever, but let's say, you know, let's say one of your kids, you know, did something wrong and then it came and said, daddy, I'm so sorry. You know, I really shouldn't have like, uh, you know, please tell me what I can do to make it. I know that this was wrong. I'm, I'm really like, you would be just, <laughs> would you be just in just saying, no, I'm going to punish you anyways. You did what was wrong. Like, like if I you're a good guess. father, if you're, if you're a good father, like, you know, I mean, I guess like, in the sense that like there must be consequences, right? Yes. Like you might punish, but but my point is that uh, I guess I'm just trying to illustrate that 
if we're talking about goodness and we're talking about what moves God, like, isn't it, isn't it another one of those like worlds that doesn't exist where God, in spite of people's humility and repentance and God, please have mercy on me a sinner. He's like, nah, you deserve to be punished anyways. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. That that's, that may be like, it makes for a good, it, it makes for a good rhetorical point regarding right. God's justice but he's not just just; he's also merciful he's, and loving. That's what so, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, it's maybe yeah. just, but it's not lovingly just. Right. And God right. can't be just just; he has to be right. lovingly just. All of his attributes are in perfect balance. Exactly yeah. right. Uh, he's not in he's not in pieces uh, like sometimes mm. we sometimes we are. And I think the other thing too it, that one thing that uh, what's so what's so interesting about. Uh, all these times that we, we, uh, we listen to Calvinists and we listen to, to what they have to say is that they'll say one thing and then go on to talk about something else and then kind of wreck that other thing they were saying. And uh, Sean does that later on when he says that God immutably decrees mm. those that would be saved. Yeah. So yeah, exactly right. You re but If you say that God decrees those who will have faith and those who won't, then you remove that meaningful real distinction between God's actions and man's actions. Mm. God, the man is just playing out God's decrees and yeah. that's not the same as men acting. That's not the same as men doing things independently of God. And so, let's, and let's be theologically specific with our language here. We are acting in accordance with what he has decreed period. There was one decree. It encompassed everything. It was uh, at the moment of creation, he decreed all of these things to happen unchangeably and mutually. Right. So even saying he decrees things, nope, he decreed everything yeah. immutably, That's unchangeably. That's a better way to say it. But we're, you're confusing the categories. Yes, we're saved by faith, but we're not elected by faith. Okay. We're justified by faith, but we're not elected by faith. We are not elected by faith. Hmm. Okay, let's look at what the scriptures say. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 13, which is actually a common passage that uh, Reformed Calvinists will turn to to prove their point, but they'll stop where they ought not stop. But we ought to thank God always for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning, God has chosen you, that word is elect, chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief, that's faith, mm. in the truth. How is this not conditional election unto salvation? It's, and, it's, and you could say it's, un, it's conditional individual election unto salvation. It's, it says through. And, see, and the interesting thing here is, too, is that if you get the, the elect standard version or the extremely saved version, uh, which is a little bit more uh, Calvinistically leaning. I, uh, use the, I, use, I use the ESV. Does that mean I'm slowly becoming ca Calvinist? Definitely. Is that, okay. Definitely. All right. Well. Definitely. Um, and so it says, uh, chose, uh, from the beginning, God has chosen you, comma, Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Ignore that. So chosen for chosen you for salvation, comma, through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. So it's separating the through. It's through being set apart by the Holy Spirit's conviction of sin and belief in the truth. Like, and, and the other question might be, it says from the beginning. It doesn't say from the beginning of time. From the beginning of what? It doesn't say that. That's right. Like, so I just think it's so interesting that he says we're not elect. By faith, and he also said right there at the right there at the end, uh, the reformed have to have these categories right. We recognize that you have categories. We reject those categories. We think that your categories are, you know, no offense, but made up in order to unfalsify the system and insulate it from criticism. Because as soon as we say we start talking about election and salvation, it's like, well, well, that's that's really that's different. That's a different category. It's a different kind of election. Well, that's, you know, we recognize that we're saved by grace through faith. We're saved through faith, but we're not, we're not chosen by faith. <laughs> First of all, we've seen that actually yeah. we are. <laughs> and then secondly, like we're not, we reject that you have separated these two into two different categories. So I don't know how else to say that. Do you want to add anything to that? 
No, I think that this is a, a common uh, reform tactic. This is what I see them doing all the time, is that it's not primarily uh, biblical theology. Or and, and I know that this is a, this is polemic. I know that this they would disagree with this. I understand, uh, but they're not doing biblical theology primarily. What they're doing is category creation and systematic harmonization. They're taking right. these different things and they're putting them in categories and they're showing exactly how they work and where they work. And they're going, and so, so discussing with a uh, reformed person, having these kinds of dialogues with a reformed person, especially in this kind of medium where somebody puts out a long form broadcast and then you put a long form broadcast and then they go back and forth, that th- the main thing going on here is the switching in between categories and the placing of ideas and passages into categories. And we're, and, and Sean, if you would, we really want to have a dialogue with you. We really do want to move deeper and move this dialogue along and, and make progress in understanding and in discussing our actual points of contention. We're not ex- expecting you to agree with us. We're not expecting anything except just an understanding of where our points of contention actually are. And so if you want to get there, repeating where your categories are, repeating, uh, repeatedly talking about the lines of where your views isn't going to get us anywhere. We're not going to move along. You have to recognize that we reject those categories. And you'd like, if you'd like, you can put on our goggles and see in what categories we're talking about. And, and then deal with it. And yeah. then deal with it. And then go, okay, wait a minute. If they reject these categories, how would they think about it? Put those goggles yeah. on and then and perhaps you can come to a greater understanding of what we're saying. And then tell us how we're wrong about that. Please do. Please right. tell us how right. we're wrong about what we're actually saying. Right. Right. And I think, it, and it's like, so it's like, here's provisionism, right? Reform theology is true. Therefore, nope you're looking at you have two different categories here and that's not how we like how like how i just i don't know how to respond to to the category creation like if you so if we're talking about uh your will be done on earth as is as it is in heaven or we're talking about where they uh resist god's will in Acts 17 uh Acts 7 verse 51 where it says you know you stiff-necked like you resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers have always done. Well, that's a different kind of resisting. That's resisting this kind. And that's a different kind of will. That's the prescriptive will versus the decorative will. How do I, how do I respond to that? Like, how do I demonstrate to you that your thinking is wrong there? I don't, what do you do with that? Doesn't, doesn't that, doesn't saying here are these two wills and these two wills are true. And then me going, okay, where do you get those from? well, we know that the following two things are true. Therefore it must, well, let's talk about these things then. Let's talk about why you think, because because these things that you think are true are creating the categories, aren't they? Like, Yeah, you have to somehow get past it and drill back into the, okay, wait a minute. Where did you get the idea that election is individual, effectual, regeneration unto salvation from eternity past. Where did you get this, this idea from? Where in the Bible? If it's not in the Bible, where? Where did you get the idea that God has prescriptive will and indicative will? Where? And if the answer is not in the Bible, then you have, where did you get these ideas? Where where did these categories come from? Right. Uh, But yeah, besides beyond that, I don't know. I think what happens is, right, this is, this is what I would say, right? They see, they see before creation, they say, see, this means before time. And then up here, we go to Romans nine, and then it says, well, see, before Jacob and Esau were born, before they had done any evil. So that means it's completely unconditional. So unconditional before time. And then, and then as a result of kind of like, you know, you know, holding these two together, and we think obviously reading them wrongly, then it just naturally Oh, that makes sense. There's actually two different kinds here. But so what if the, what if the Bible isn't supposed to be a system, though? Sure. Where do you right. get the okay? So drill down even to a layer later farther. Where do you get the idea that the Bible is supposed to be is rightly systematized? I I don't. I that's not a biblical idea. That you can't 
get, I think the Bible actually resists systems. Mm. I think it holds things in tension on purpose. We've had some conversations about uh, uh, online about the, the doctrine of election. What, what doctrine of election? Election just means to choose. <laughs> the doctrine of God's choosing, yeah. choosing what, for what, when, how, <laughs> like, right. If you don't, and, and, and I'm okay with doctrine as a concept, obviously. Sure. I'm, sure. A, I'm a Protestant Christian. I'm yeah. down with doctrine. Yeah. But if you don't have a teaching in the Bible that in one place, in one context, Mm. teaches mm. that doctrine you don't have the doctrine and and the one and and if you want to see me get triggered and start twitching i can hear in my brain the reformed responding back to me and going aha uh -huh, what about the trinity uh -huh. i heard that too i heard did that you, voice did you, too did you hear me that in your brain right on that. Uh, yeah oh yeah i heard the that. trinity yeah. it says a trinity yeah there are places in the bible where clearly God is triune. It's 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 there. Okay, yeah, we didn't develop Let us a, make man in our image. Make th there is. I'm gonna make a, 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 I'm gonna make a place for my Lord to put uh, a footstool on his feet. I'm it's Ezekiel. I'm, yeah. It's, I'm, I, I, my Lord said to my Lord. Yahweh yeah. said to my Lord. I'm gonna make it. Yeah. So you are there are places where th this is taught. And okay, we didn't come up with the language. I'm not, ex I'm not expecting you to come up with somewhere in the Bible that uses the words effectual, irresistible, regeneration of the salvation. That's not, that's not that, what I'm expecting. Is that unreasonable to ask for that, though? Is that unreasonable? I don't no. feel like it is. Because where where does this come from? <laughs> I'm, you know? But I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm going to be okay, okay with that. Okay. I'm going to okay. say you don't need that. That's, that's fine. But show me where it means that. Show right. me what biblical right. language is used to mean that thing in the context of a narrative, wisdom, literature, didactic, theological teaching epistle. Where is that? I can show you that on the Trinity and at the same time acknowledging that we didn't need to come up with it until the actual language until later. That's, that's not what we're talking about. Where does it mean that in one place? Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't see it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that, then you, right, you don't have a doctrine of election. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians 1, 3 and following. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through jesus christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he's blessed us in the beloved again i want you to notice the active words there that god's the one doing the choosing god's the one doing the predestination okay so in their view in the corporate view of election predestination is not God's active choice before time to actually choose individuals to salvation, to be holy and blameless before him. Uh, what predestination is, is God's choice of the destination of those who will freely believe. So it's more of a plan. God chooses the plan. God chooses the destination. God chooses what will happen to a person if they meet the conditions of repentance and faith. So if you place your faith in Jesus, you get in on the plan that God predestined. So there's no individual predestination to salvation. It's more of a, of a plan that God set up. So he, so he started in verse 3, right? Yes. So what does, I, I tell you, there's a secret code for figuring out if somebody's going to be reformed or not when they teach through Ephesians 1, and it's whether or not they include verse 1 and 2, to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. So who is the us? This is the point, this is the point of contention that I would like him to deal with. The us is the faithful in Christ Jesus. 
are you are you in Christ Jesus before time, before you're faithful? And then you get to be faithful in, and then when you become faithful, you get to be faithful in Christ Jesus. Like, and then he get, he says things like, um, you know, God's the one that's doing the choosing and predestining. Amen. Amen. Like, so we don't we don't disagree with that. Um, it's more of a plan from eternity past rather than choosing individuals. He's, I mean, I could say he's he's choosing individuals in so far as they are the faithful in Christ Jesus. Right. and have trusted in him they're part of the choice one the chosen one jesus the og chosen one right who i, I don't know about you eric but i wasn't around before creation <laughs> to be chosen <laughs> i think it's more man-centered around the man christ jesus uh to say that uh we're chosen in him when we're connected to him by faith not mm. that somehow we're in him before creation um especially because of uh, verse 13, which he goes on to talk about. Do you have anything else to add to that? I actually have, I don't even think the us, this, you, you may disagree with me here on this one. He says to the fa- saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you right. and peace from God. So he says you, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who's yeah. so then he says, Blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ who blesses us. Okay. Yeah. And then he goes right. on, so us, us, in yeah. him, verse seven, in him we. Okay. Yeah. Lavished upon us, us, yeah. we, we, in him we have attended. Okay. So that, and then verse 12, so that we, who is this? We who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Okay. Good point. So yeah. who are the who are the first to hope in Christ? It can't. Were you be, the first to trust in Christ? Was I the first to trust in Christ? Were even the Ephesian Christians the first to trust in Christ? Twenty yeah. years after Pentecost. Good point. Uh-huh. Good point. Valid so points. so then he says. So is, what you're down. so then he says verse thirteen. In him you also. Oh, it's the first time he uh, said you again. And since for sec, verse two, so then he goes back to you. So all of this us stuff is the apostles, maybe? It's mm. the first generation Jews who came out of Jerusalem, maybe? Mm. The mm. first who were up in Christ, and they were the ones to first spread the church, which has now reached Ephesus 20 years later. And then he says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When? Was that in eternity past? No, when yeah. you heard and believed in him, were sealed in the promised Holy Spirit. So I think you could, I think you could say it this way. You could, you could have it both ways, right? You could say that the us are the apostles, the first to trust in Christ, and that those who trust in Christ are continually grafted into the us. So then, what is true about the us and the you becomes true together for those who are in Christ by faith. But and I think that's ex- so. But you have to acknowledge that uh, progression. You have to acknowledge right. the pronoun that the Bible is using. We yeah. care about the grammar of the Bible, right? Yeah. And we talked about this last time. Does Is God getting down exactly what he wants to get down? Is he, is he getting the pronouns exactly the way that he wants them? Does his mind exactly reflect the truth that's revealed in his word? So the, the you and us would be important. We would want to talk about that, right? We would like, want to figure out what that um, means and who, how does that play in? So even if you, want to, even if you wanted to say that the apostles were especially chosen in a certain way that you and I were not. Right. That, that would be fine. We'd be, we'd be fine with that kind of election. But right. then what is, who, who is the you also? The you also is the Ephesian Christians 20 years later more related to us than to the apostles. And then, so when were we joined with their election? When we believed the word they said. And it's not as though this election thing like started happening right after, like, I I know Calvinists don't believe that. They would say that God, like, you can be among God's people, the chosen ones, but then even, so Israel was chosen, but even in the corporate body of Israel, there's a subset of those who are elect by grace through faith. Um, So like, it's not as though there's like this, uh, this category creation of uh, apostles becoming chosen and then we get grafted into that. We're saying that uh, chosen 
in general doesn't need to mean like have all of this baggage and stuff. No, it doesn't. And I'm just going to quote what I think Leighton Flowers had actually said in one of his YouTube clips. This may not be verbatim, but basically something like this. God has not decided who will believe or not believe in Jesus. Instead, God decided the destination of those who believe. You see the difference? Our view says God actually did decide who will believe and not believe in Jesus. God individually chose and predestined sinners to believe or not believe in Jesus, to be saved. What they're saying is God basically decided on the destination. He says that's what the word predestination means, to the destination of those who believe. And again, this is corporate election. God chose a plan. God chose a destination. The destination is the elect group, the church, the elect. Um, but God did not choose individuals per se. And the way that you get into the plan or the way that you reach the destination that God had set out before time is that you use your libertarian free will to get into Christ by faith. You meet those conditions. Whoa, Eric, did are you wearing like a collared shirt now? I don't know if it's so for our audio listeners, Eric's wearing a collared shirt. I don't know where. Did you just have a wardrobe change or something? Is yeah, I just had to go. I had to go change real quick. I don't just. Okay. In the middle of, okay. Uh, if, through the magic of YouTube. Uh, yeah. it's, it's next week and, uh, we're still responding yeah. to Sean Cole, uh, yeah. and we're going to get into it here. Let's do it. So in general, this is starting at around the 22 minute mark. Uh, brother Sean gives, uh, Eric, I don't know if you agree with this. I think it's a, a really fair yeah. representation of our view. Um, and, but it's really bizarre. Uh, from memory, he does this uh, once or twice where he's, he's represent, representing our view quite well. Um, and then around the 23-minute mark, he says that <laughs> it, it seems like he makes it sound as absurd as possible without actually like um, saying what we, the, in the way that we might say it. But he says, you use your libertarian free will to get into Christ by faith. Eric, do you believe that you you use your libertarian free will to get into Christ? Is it I don't understand what what that means. Is it is it like this am I is it a thing I have in my hand? Is it like a, <laughs> is it like a tool? Is it how do I use it? How do I how do I my... how do I use my libertarian free will? It's such a strange way to talk about well, you just used your love to entice your wife to marry you, or you lose, you use your your love to get your kids to to like you. And, and I think it, the way that he speaks of it almost makes it sound like a superpower. Like we can just use, like if I just <laughs> use my libertarian free will, and then I can get I can get into Superman Christ. used his laser eyes. To get into Lex Luthor's hidden base. Yeah, something like that. I don't right. know. Crazy. Uh, but so, but we would say, right, that that we we believe, and that Christ, or I guess rather the Father, puts us in Jesus. Like bab the scriptures talk about baptizing us into His body. So I'm not sure why He kind of felt the need to. Uh, it feels like a straw man. Uh, I mean, well, maybe okay. It's... So, because the way he described it, like you say, is he does a really, really good job. Uh, yeah. He represents it fairly, and I think he knows he's representing it maybe too fairly. Too well. yeah. he, he's representing it too well. And Sounds a little bit too plausible. Too plausible, too reasonable. So then he has to say, "You use your libertarian free will to get in," and. That's where he, he jumps the shark, not just in charitability and, and he does it is trying to make it sound as absurd as possible. But our libertarian, even if you, I want to adopt his terminology and say that that libertarian free will that I'm using, my laser eyes that I use uh, to get into Lex Luthor's lair, uh, that doesn't that's not how that actually works on provisionism. That's not how we think it works. That's not we, we right. I think that's the biblical right. idea. The libertarian free will that you use, uh, using his his ridiculous terminology, 
that doesn't get you anything. Yeah. That doesn't, that doesn't, yeah. Okay, so you have right. faith. So you have faith in Christ. Yeah. The demons. Say, the demons believe yeah. and tremble. That's mm. that has mm. nothing. That doesn't get you. Well, God, well, you know, he believed. I've got a. Yeah. Right. I'm ob I'm obligated now. Yeah. I have, uh, he's yeah. pulling my leg, pulling my arm. He won. You know that human being. He won the arm wrestling match with the Almighty God. So, yeah. mm, gotta let him into the family. God has graciously, uh, in His loving kindness, promised to place in Christ the ones who believe. It's all right. of grace. It's all of him. It's monergistic. It's nothing we can do. Anything that we do, even use our laser eyes, doesn't get us anything. Yeah. I'm trying to be charitable. I don't I don't think that Brother Sean like said this on purpose, like in the sense of like trying to mis misrepresent. Like mm -hmm. I want to try to be charitable and and not assume on any motives or anything here. Uh, but it just seems like m maybe, maybe it just seemed quite plausible and it was, and it was making a lot of sense. And so then it just kind of came out like, you know, then you use, but he does say this quite frequently. Like he said that in the, um, I was just catching up on the debate between Rex and Hunter and Layton, uh, and, uh, Tyler Vela and Sean Cole. Yeah. And he used this term, uh, use your free will a couple of times as well, or use your libertarian free will, um, which I think doesn't quite hit on the point of contention. And he doesn't, he if, doesn't I, if, I could, if I could take a crack, if I could take a crack at it, I wonder if what he's making, trying to say is he sees our view as too Western, too individualistic. Mm, that mm. you know you give human beings to credit just like the humanistic mm -hmm. uh culture of our day you give human beings too much credit and right. so we have this superpower this you think that humans have the superpower that can be sovereign over god or use your libertarian free will to get into heaven or or that's just genuinely how he sees it he, he sees a the idea of a libertarian free will to be a humanistic uh, giving men too much power uh, type right. of thing. And so he just right. genuinely sees it that way. And, and so he's going sure, sure. to he's gonna use that terminology, use your free will, use your laser eyes sure. Uh, sure. To, to do it. So that, that's, mm -hmm. if I'm being as charitable as I can there. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. And he does go on to say, uh, who is doing the predestining and choosing? Um, and we don't, uh, we don't disagree that God's the one doing the predestining and the choosing. I mean, I think that he, I think that his encapsulation of uh, that God decides the destiny beforehand is a perfectly viable understanding of the word predestined and that he's predestining us. Uh, sure, he does talk a bit, a bit about the direct object. Who's he predestining? He's not predestining a plan. He's predestining us. But we would say that the us he's predestining is uh, what's been referred to as an anachronistic or like a, a um, what do you call it? Like a, not in a time kind of way, but like referring to us in the general sense of those of us who are in Christ, not as in like a, this is a category that exists that all of those who will inevitably believe who he's going to sovereignly, you know, regenerate and stuff. Um, and so we agree that God's doing, doing the predestining and choosing. He says a few things like that as though we don't believe that. Um, and we, right. That, we that do. he, that we, so, we, we believe that he's not predestining. That, he's just, he was predestining a plan, not a people. No, the yeah. people is the plan. He, he's predestining right. a people. He's just yeah. not predestining which individuals get into the people group. Right. right. Uh, you know, so, so a plan, not a people, I guess that that's a, that's a nice sort of tweet length jab too. Uh, you believe a plan, not a people, but the people are the plan it, right. that, that right. he would have, he would have a remnant. He would have a family of faithful that believe in him that are going to follow him. Uh, that's the plan. He, he, and, mm. and the only way that that plan works 
uh, to have the kind of people that he wants, the, 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 the people that are believing ones, is if he allows people by, the, by being in the image of God to choose whether or not to be a part of that family or not. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's not a family. It's, it's not a people. And this is, of course, my perspective. I know you would disagree with this, but it's, it's not a group of true believers if they're compatibilistically caused to believe. That's not what belief means. That's not what faith means. That's not what trust means. Those words require the person to be able to not do those things so that when they are doing those things, you know it's genuine. You know their, their belief isn't just caused by the mind of some other cosmic being. Their belief is theirs. Uh, mm-hmm. And it could have been a different way. And so the ones that are in the group, the ones that are... Uh, become a part of the plan, a part of the people that that he he formed, are truly there and truly love Jesus, and, mm-hmm. and, and there is an actual ability for a relationship there because they could not be there if they chose a different path. Uh, so, yeah. And so the question is the the thing that we would we would uh, you know sort of diverge a bit is that once you're once you're like in him can you get out of him, you know, would be sort of the, uh, the thing that we, uh, disagree on, which might be a, you know, we'll, could be a good topic for an episode one day where we, we charitably, uh, and I think, uh, you know, later on in this, he, it's around the 30 minute mark here in my notes. I'm not sure if that's the exact stamp, but, uh, he says, you put yourself in Christ. <laughs> so that's, so that's right. That's no, how, so right. That's no, how he sees don't. it. Right. That's, that's yeah. how he sees it. He sees it yeah. as, you use your laser eyes to get into Lex Luthor's hidden base. Yeah, yeah. You humanistically give humans too much power. You put yourself in Christ. Yep. Yeah. And and as I was looking at this, as as I because I wanted to find out, uh, and I've not uh, done as much extensive study on this as I wanted to, but a little bit of a cursory look. I wanted to Google like, so how is it that the the scriptures talk about how we get into Christ in Christ? Um, and so I Googled it and I came up with this article here um, from Got Questions, which is a well-known uh, Calvinistic source, whether or not, I mean, <laughs> those who are in the know know that it is, but I think a lot of people don't know, uh, which is fine. Uh, and it says, what does it mean to be in Christ is the, is the title of it. So if you want to Google it, I think we'll, we could probably put it in the show notes or something like that. Um, and interestingly, through this whole uh, article here, it doesn't reference Ephesians one, which I find I find that Ephesians one mentions in him. Uh, I think it's like a tenor in him or in the beloved or in Christ, something like ten to fifteen times. Like it's a, right. a number it's of times over and over again. Yeah. And so I guess if I can just read something here that we agree with, like maybe this is common, you know, ground. That's, that's, that, what, I was, that's what I was gonna say. I was gonna say if they don't if, if they don't reference Ephesians one, then it sounds like we might just agree with them. That we might just agree with them we or might, disagree with them. No, we might agree with them. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've given I've given this a, a cursory look, so I've not read it um, like in depth, but I'm just going to uh, highlight some things here. Uh, so it says, uh, uh, Galatians 3, 26 to 28 gives us insight into the phrase in Christ and what it means in Christ. You are all children of God through faith. Uh, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Uh, there is neither, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor there, is there a male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul speaking to the Christians in Galatia, reminding them of their new identity since they placed their faith in Jesus Christ. To be, quote, baptized into Christ means that they were identified with Christ, having left their old sinful lives and fully embracing the new life in Christ. When we respond to the Holy Spirit's drawing, he baptizes us into the family of God. So that's like what you were talking about, Eric, into yeah. the family of God. First Corinthians twelve thirteen says, for we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to, to drink. So I, I agree with this 100%, uh, you know, 
provisionist stamp of approval That's right. <laughs> on this. I, I wouldn't have said that any different. Um, he goes on to, you know, describe this some more. And, and so I just think that's interesting, right? In the treatment of what it means to be in Christ, Ephesians 1 isn't mentioned because if you're going to assert essentially that we get into Christ and are placed into him by trusting in Christ and then the spirit baptizes us into him, then, then why wouldn't it then follow that Ephesians chapter 1 verse, verse 13 essentially is talking about how it is that we get into him. Um, I think this undermines their position on being chosen as individuals before the set, before the foundation of the world. It, it, it seems like you can't have it both. Like in him either means what that answer and got question means, or it means what Sean Cole seems to be saying it means, which is you were chosen in him before the foundation of the world, chosen to be in him, right. you know, it's, it's always assumed that, that a me to be verb is there, uh, in the yeah. text. It's, it's not there, but that's how it's always translated. Uh, you know, when right. Calvin is talking about Ephesians one, it's you're chosen to be in Christ. Doesn't say that. Or at least that's how they understand it. That's how they understand it. Yeah. That's how it's interpreted. Yeah. That's how they, it do, doesn't say that you're chosen in him. So, so yeah, if, if the way we get in him is through trust and then, uh, God brings us in that, that, Great. Then right. the question becomes right. perfect. We agree with that. Then the big question becomes: Then what were we chosen for? What what, what were we predestined for? And it, it can't be a salvation because that's something. It can't be that happens in Christ, right? Yeah. It can't be chosen to have faith because that's that's not what in Christ means according to God. Questions, uh, right? Right. And uh, probably so. I've talked to some some uh, Calvinist guys on this, and and some would say. You're chosen to be in Christ. And then others would say, like, oh, you are chosen in him before the, that, that is before the foundation of the world. So in some sense, we're in him b- before creation. Um, but what happens is this happens in time. This is when this happens in time is yeah. that we're put in him. And I don't, again, I don't know how to respond to that. Like, how do you, like, right? There's okay, a, there's, but, there's but, a realm of truth that is temporal and a ra- realm of truth that is transcendent. Yeah. And they are and, both true at the same time, even if they contradict. Right. Right. If, even if you're and, saying not a, a versus not a, a equals not a, even if you're saying a equals not a, that's okay to say because one a is in the temporal realm and one a is in the transcendent realm. Right. Am I, does that sound like yeah, what I'm, they I have mean, to be I think saying? that it's, it's usually a, and you know, our reformed brothers and sisters will have to forgive me on this, but but a new category is created that you can chuck that into the bucket of right. temporal or transcendent so that it's then unfalsifiable so that then you can't level anything against it. And so then uh, I would just say, you know, to someone like Brother Sean or someone else, so so if this is what God Question says, which we agree with, and uh, and this is our view on Ephesians 1 and corporate election of being in Christ by faith, then what's wrong with our interpretation? What's wrong with that? And I think that uh, both John Piper and a broadcast that I've heard, as well as uh, Sean, uh, refers to other passages like Acts Acts thirteen forty eight to say, "Hey, here's this passage over here. Right, they have teaches to what I believe that it is, and so that's how we know what this is talking about here." Whereas I would say, you know, we can talk about Acts thirteen forty eight, and so theology one hundred one has some. Uh, a good brief episode on that and a lot of dialogue surrounding that. So we won't repeat that here. Um, but, but that's, that's, yeah. that's not a solid biblical hermeneutics to go to some other context somewhere else. That's like, that's like uh, watching a movie uh, and then saying, Oh, that makes, that's what this other, a totally different movie means because that movie over there said that, uh, yeah. you know, you yeah. take ten, 10 minutes of this movie and translate it into another, it's a totally different context. It's a totally different, yeah. situation different audience different, different audience purpose. i uh, mean especially acts which is a narrative yeah uh, right. you know not an epistle right so even here like it says in, in this article to be it's at the beginning of the third paragraph to be in christ means we have accepted his sacrifice as a payment for our own sin okay um got questions and sean cole does does being in christ also mean that we have accepted his sacrifice as a payment for our own sin in Ephesians 1? 
because Eric and I and the provisionists do. <laughs> I just that sounds I good would to me. Love that's that's my biggest question. I think would be how do you square the circle? Um, and again, maybe it would be an appeal to the well, we're in Christ in one sense, but not in another sense. And and I don't know how to respond to that. I don't, you know, fine, that's your opinion. Um, now deal with our view and why it's wrong. So that was our two-part review of Sean Cole's podcast entitled The Fatal Flaws of Provisionism. Uh, in our first episode, we gave a positive case for provisionism. Now we have spent the last uh, two episodes responding to someone who's bringing some critiques. And we think that Sean does o overall. I, I genuinely believe that he is truly trying his best and doing a good job most of the time mm. in, in contrasting our views and trying to represent us fairly. Uh, we think he, he misses it just a little bit and we would really love to have continued dialogue with him because yeah. I have hope and I think that that dialogue would be fruitful. Uh, so we'd love to have dialogue with him on this. And so yeah, please go check out his podcast uh, understanding Christianity uh, and, and for, sure. uh, for a fair representation of uh, how the reformed see provisionism. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I've got, I've gotten really familiar with Sean Cole over the past uh, couple weeks, as far as listening to his broadcasts and stuff. Uh, I mentioned the debate uh, that he had with brother Layton and Braxton and alongside Tyler, uh, which is very informative. I think that if you want to hear Calvinists uh, represent their position uh, well, and, and from their perspective, go listen to that. It's good. It's on YouTube. Um, and I would highly recommend, uh, so Sean, brother Sean puts, um, a number of his sermons up here and they're really good. Like in, in so far as he's not teaching about a passage that is like, you know, John 10 about sheep or Ephesians one, you know, in this case, like we've talked about, he speaks ex exactly as I would as a provisionist. And so, uh, you know, many of you ask, where can we get some provisionist sermons? Uh, I, you know, I would encourage you guys to go listen to him. He's, he's got really good biblical stuff. He taught on uh, Psalm 46 about being anxious uh, and insecure during this time with the coronavirus, COVID-19. And, uh, and I highly recommend them. I think you guys go check him out, uh, show him some love. And, uh, you know, we'll keep pushing back on him a little bit as we disagree over the provisionism thing. But uh, we're brothers and, and we're in this together. And, and I'd, I'd like to think we both have the same goal is just believing the truth of the scriptures. So uh, that's all we have for today. And we'll see you next time on The Provisionist Perspective. See ya. Thank you.